Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to be reviewing the Odroid H2 system on a chip right after this. So uh, there have been many reviews about the H2 and over time. And so I finally got one. <laughs> and I'll, I'll talk more about that when I get there. But uh, I wanted to make wanted to take a look at this and see um, just how well it will perform in in a situation either as a server or as a workstation or perhaps a little of both. So let's let's take a look at some of the details behind this. It was announced long ago, back in November of 2018, and it was delayed, um, at least for ordering. It was delayed by Intel because Intel could not produce significant numbers of the J4105 chip, uh, which is a Celeron or a Gemini Lake. And those got pushed back further and further, and finally June, Intel had enough chips to be able to ship to hard kernel uh, to start the initial uh, shipments and, and, and get the ordering process going. And demand was so high for these units, they sold out literally within minutes. There was... I remember at least five rounds where, you know, with long delays in between of when they would announce, okay, we've got them, and then you would go to the site and they were sold out already. So, yeah, it took a while for <laughs> me to finally get one. So I did finally in January manage to to uh, snag one of these units uh, to be able to test it. So okay, so what is it? So it is, like I said, it's a Celeron J4105. It's a quad-core processor, which will run up to 2.5 gigahertz. Uh, I believe that the standard, uh, is, and when you're in a Linux situation, is around 2.3, although everything that I have seen inside of, a, of the Linux operating system shows it to be running at 2.5. So I don't know. There's a lot of confusion around the specs for that chip, uh, but anyway, the confusion probably is just mine. It's a 14 nanometer chip, has a uh, <clears throat> 10 watts of, uh, of TDP, so it's a very low power consumption chip. Four megabytes of L2 cache, not anything to really write home about, but it's okay. I mean, it, a lot of people used to always call the Celeron just a brain damaged version of the Pentium uh, chip set, so uh, because they basically <laughs> ripped out most of the cache. Uh, it does have a UHD graphics 600 uh, set, so yeah, it's not performance in the graphics arena that you're going to be able to write home about or to play games on. Uh, it does have dual Ethernet, one gigabyte. They're both uh, real tech from my analysis. Uh, it is. It does support dual channel SODM memory and. Uh, uh, I had some initial problems with this, and I'll talk about that when I get to it. It, that, it does support DDR4, 19200, up to 16 gig and 2400 MT per second. So I'll give you a spec that does work for the memory on this. They, of course, recommend Samsung. And right now, the Samsung memory is a little bit more expensive than some of the other options. So um, it does offer two SATA 3 ports, and there are two SATA power ports that are there, but it does require a, a special cable in order for those power ports to work. Uh, it does not use uh, the typical SATA power that you would find on a PC power, PSU. Uh, the M2 NVMe slot for storage, it is a PCIe 2.0 by four lanes, and, and it does not support uh, NVMe SATA drives, so it only supports NVMe M.2 drives. So if you want to put something in there, it has to be an M.2. It has two USB 2.0 ports and two USB 3.0 ports. It has one uh, version 1.2 display port and one 2.0 HDMI uh, display port. It does have a, a battery backup BIOS, and that battery comes included with the motherboard. Also, it, ha it requires, uh, I think they say a 14-volt power supply, but they recommend a 15-volt 4-amp power supply. 
uh, is recommended. Now, I noticed that with this board, if you're intending to plug an external uh, USB hub into this, make sure it's powered because there is not enough power on those left in that power supply to be able to drive a uh, USB hub that's unpowered. That's not uncommon. I find that a lot. Uh, also, it does support a uh, cooling fan connector, and that's on the uh, on the uh, motherboard. It does use PWM, and it does cycle according to the needs of the uh, CPU. Um, it, but uh, hard kernel says that this does not require a uh, a a power a, a fan in order to keep it thermally cool. It uses. Uh, Passive cooling has a very large heat sink on top. I have not tested running this without the fan yet. When I do my benchmarks, I might do that just to see if it throttles. I suspect that you will need a fan if it's inside of a case. As I'm just going to select some pieces out of this. This is uh, this is uh, Hard Kernel's photos of the uh, motherboard. Uh, along with their markings on it. So I'm just going to pick and choose a few of these. The A, uh, of course, is in the center, and that is the CPU. The B is on the other board, and that is the SIM and, do and uh, DIMM slots over here. Then you have the NVMe slot down here, and that does take a 2280 uh, board, so uh, not a big problem there. But you will notice that there are no positions in between so it is only 2280 <laughs> so if you're planning on put something smaller i see something on this drawing that may allude to some smaller holes but you might be <clears throat> i did not see that on my board and uh, <laughs> i don't think they're actually there um, also there is uh, the emc slot so if you want to use an EMMC to boot from. Now, of course, that's going to be quite a bit slower than an, an M.2. Uh, those usually run about 200 megabits per second, somewhere in there. So about four or five, four or five times faster than an SS and then a SD card uh, would run. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> they're not real quick. Also, it has over here on the uh, it, over here on E and F. F is the SATA ports. E is the power ports for that. And it does, as I said, require a special connector. Up here, there are five LEDs, and some of those are for power. Some of those are for status. Some of them indicate whether you're reading off the M.2 or off the EMMC. There's also a light if you're using if you have I/O going on on the SATA ports as well. There is a <clears throat> there is also a peripheral header over here. This is similar to uh, it is not compatible with the Pi, but this would be similar to that kind of thing for uh, maker type activities. Uh, it is a peripheral expansion port. Uh, <clears throat> I'll let you know if it will support PCI uh, PCIe. I don't think it does, but I'll let you know as I test. I, there's, I can't find a whole lot of information about that. But uh, there's a power switch and a reset switch here at the top. And then there is a battery connector down here on the bottom that's next to the power ports for the, for the uh, SATA. Uh, and then there is, that's the uh, battery backup. And then on the opposite side over here is the cooling fan for the CPU. Uh, again, they say you don't need it, and then of course you just have your, you know, your your two Realtek ports, your Display Port, your HDMI port, your USB ports here, and then your audio ports. Now it does have a digital audio connector here, so haven't tried that yet, so don't can't tell you much about that. As for power consumption, idle is four watts. Under stress with the GPU, it'll, it will reach up to 22 watts. Now, that's not my measurements. That's uh, hard kernels measurements. Uh, I'll get to that <laughs> when, I, uh, when I start my uh, benchmark testing. Power off a half a watt and about half a watt for suspend, 0.6. Uh, there are some confusing statements on the H2 wiki. Um, they said it would that there is a one line that says it'll support up to 32 gig of memory, so I decided to test that. And no, it does not. It will not post. However, with, with uh, uh, two 8 gig sticks, uh, it will post with 16 gig, no problem at all. And uh, <clears throat> that's the memory I use, the Crucial Kit here. 
Uh, it's about $58 on Amazon. The uh, Samsung memory that's in that same vein at the time that I was <clears throat> putting the system together was about $20 more. Uh, that is the recommended memory for the system, by the way, is to use the Samsung one. Um, you can use less, of course, less memory if you want. Uh, there are specs on their site for that if you want to check. That's a heart kernel site. Also, I installed a Samsung 970 Evo, 500 gig NVMe. It was about 88 bucks. There is a BIOS backup battery that's included. So you don't need to buy one of those unless you just want one for, uh, you know, it, it, when, when that one wears out in a couple of years. But probably by that time, you'd be ready to change out the board anyway. Uh, cooling fan about $6 and the power cable is about 3 So uh, the other thing, the Odroid does not include Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. So you'll need a dongle, a USB dongle to do that. And you'll have to give up one of your USB ports if you want to support Wi-Fi or, and or Bluetooth. Uh, you can purchase several different kinds of cases. There's a NAS case. There's one that has uh, a couple of different options for expansion in order, in order to hold your hard drives if you want to do that. I selected the uh, Type 3, which is just the case, the CPU. It doesn't have any room in it for uh, any hard drives, which is fine. Uh, the <clears throat> battery and fan connectors are keyed, so you don't have to worry about installing those backwards, which... In the case of the battery, it could damage the motherboard. Same for the SATA power connectors. They're also keyed, so you don't have to worry about <clears throat> flipping them around the other way. So initially, uh, when I got around to installing the operating system, I started out with Alpine because I was kind of hoping to use that machine uh, as a, a Docker machine with Alpine running on it, but um, ran into an issue where Alpine would not boot. Uh, it got past uh, it got past the initial stage, the stage one, but when it got to the grub loader, it failed. And after reading on the Alpine site, it looks like the problem is when it was trying to pull the UFE uh, uh, areas. Uh, now, Alpine says they partially support UFE, but unfortunately. Uh, with the BIOS on, on the H2 and the level of support that Alpine provides for UFE, uh, this board, the, the H2 will not work, um, at least with this BIOS. There's no way in that BIOS that I could find to switch it into legacy mode. Maybe in a future release of the BIOS, maybe they'll add that capability. I don't know. But right now, uh, at the level of support that Alpine has, it will not work. I tried Ubuntu 1910 desktop. No problems. Tried uh, MX-19, no problems. Tried Fedora 31, no problems at all. Uh, in all three cases, they all came up. They all were able to uh, find the net both network connectors. They both found the video and the keyboard and mouse and all those kind of peripherals. They found the um, some of the internal connectors, and it also the fan worked on all three, so no big deals that I could see. Total cost uh, of it, the uh, H2 right now is selling for about $115 on Ameridroid in the U.S. and $111 from Hard Kernel if you order direct. Memory in my case was $58. The NVMe was $88. Power supply was $12. Uh, case was about $12. But in my, there's another one for the heads. It costs about $23. That's a NAS case. Um, that has space for additional drives in it. Uh, also, a cooling fan, $6. The SATA cable were 3 So about about $300 in all uh, for this board. So kind of pricey uh, for what you're getting, I think. Uh, but I'll again, um, I need to do some benchmarks on it yet and see how well it actually compares. You know, if you look at it, the competition and all of the things that are available out there today, is this the right kind of a board that you would want uh, to use either as a desktop or as a server? My opinion, for what it's worth, is that for $90 more, you could get an AMD Ryzen 5 2600 with a cooler a B4, and a B450 motherboard and 16 gig of memory and 500 uh, gigabyte SSD and VME for about $90 more than what that board costs, and you would have a lot more expansion capability. 
Also, if you wanted to go a little bit more money for about 70 more over the uh, 2600, you could get a six core Ryzen with a cooler uh, and, a, and a motherboard memory and an NVMe. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you're going to need a graphics card, and those are going to start about $100 and go up, <laughs> go way up. So, but, you know, the, the point is, is that the H2 is, is uh, really limited in its ability to expand. Yeah, you can add an NVMe. Yes, you can add SATA drives, but if you want to put graphics cards on it, um, uh, not going to be of much help to you. So... I mean, my opinion is the AMD would be a better <laughs> a would make would would make for a much uh, better option for either a desktop or a server uh, platform than the H2 does. Four cores with no th hyper threading. So, uh, yeah, you get four cores and four threads. That's it. So you, there's not a lot you're going to be able to do with it if you're trying to use it as, even as a Docker server, but. That's just my opinion, and uh, I hope you enjoyed this today. Um, I intend to go back and do some benchmarks on this and compare it to my other older systems. I don't have any AMDs in-house yet. Uh, working on that, but uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe as the channel grows and it can monetize a little bit, might be able to do a little bit more. But um, anyway, that's kind of where things are with that. I uh, it I think it's a it, it's a good product. I think the the hard kernel for what it is is a good product. I'm just not sure what market it's trying to enter because the AMD market is 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 actually a better place to go than the Intel in my opinion. So with that, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like and subscribe. Hope to see you all again real soon. And bye for now.